nourishing the body, getting the raw materials and nutrients that you need for stronger, healthier bones through diet, through digestion, through absorption. We need to make sure you have the right inputs to produce stronger outputs because you can't possibly expect to rebuild something that's not there. Let's ditch the quick fix and dive into today's conversation. Hey, well, welcome everyone. My guest today is Kevin Ellis, better known as The Bone Coach. Kevin is a certified integrative nutrition health coach, podcaster, YouTuber, bone health advocate, and is the founder of bonecoach.com. After an osteoporosis diagnosis in his early 30s, he realized just how challenging it can be for the average person to make sense of what needs to be done to improve and how to move forward confidently with a stronger bones plan. Today, not only has he transformed his own health and made a continuing progress on his own journey, he's now dedicated his life to helping those with osteopenia and osteoporosis gain clarity and confidence that improving is possible. His mission is to not just help over the 1 million people around the globe build stronger bones, it's to help our children and grandchildren have the education, resources, and nourishment needed to prevent osteoporosis and other diseases in the future so that they can lead long, active lives. Welcome, Kevin. Happy to have you join us today. Dr. Damon, thanks so much for having me. I appreciate it. So uh, I'm, I'm excited about this conversation. I've, I'm, you know, in the, the bone field, you might say myself, it's, it's a very prevalent uh, diagnosis. And you, at a very young age, uh, had that diagnosis hit you. So why don't you share, you know, your story? How did that, how did that impact you and what led to the, to the diagnosis and just kind of a history of of your experience with osteoporosis. Yeah, I'd be happy to share that. And, and really my personal health journey, I'll take it back a little further uh, than even my early thirties, but uh, that really started when I was much younger. Uh, when my mother was five months pregnant with me, uh, my father was told he had cancer. Uh, and two months after I was born, he passed away. He was 35 years old. And my entire life, I had this fear that I was gonna follow in his footsteps to an early grave and not have the opportunity to watch my kids grow up and experience the joys of being a father. And when I was diagnosed with osteoporosis at 31, at a time when I was still struggling to resolve all these other health issues and digestive issues and autoimmune disease and things like that, I thought my fate was destined to be the same. And I had a young daughter, a son on the way, I was devastated. And I remember the day that the doctor sat down with me and confirmed I had osteoporosis. And it wasn't just a letter in the mail, like actually sat down with me, and her exact words were, this is going to be an issue for you. Bone drugs and fracture were my future. And I walked out of that office afraid. And for the people that know me well, they know I'm not typically the most emotional person. Um, you know, I, and there are very few things that strike fear into my heart, but that did. And when I got home that night, I was laying on the couch across from my wife. Uh, my daughter was upstairs sleeping. And I looked up and I saw my favorite picture of her on the wall. And she was a little over one year old, wearing this cute polka dot dress, standing in front of a white picket fence, blonde hair, blue eyes, innocent, sweet as could be. And I just broke down crying. Mm. And I cried hard. And it was the kind of cry that just empties the sum of life's burdens. And after I was done, I remember looking over at my wife and I said, I just want to dance with my daughter on her wedding day. Uh, she needed her daddy. And at that point, I was really questioning whether I was, I was even going to be there for her. And I remember being angry and upset and overwhelmed and just scared. And I really had no idea where to start. And it took a lot of reading and research and working with different doctors and consulting with different people until I finally was able to figure some things out, get on the path to improvement. And that's it, throughout that whole struggle and that journey, that's when I realized how challenging it can be for the average person. It's mostly not the average 30 year old man. Uh, it's mostly the average woman who's diagnosed with osteopenia and osteoporosis to figure out what they need to do to address bone loss, to build bone strength, to prevent fracture, so they can have a long active life with the people they love most too. And because for most people that are diagnosed, the standard prescription is calcium, vitamin D, walking, and a bone drug. And that is woefully inadequate. And that's, it's really for that reason that I started bonecoach.com. I became bone coach. I, you know, grew a team and did all those things. So your specific health uh, history contributed to your diagnosis. It wasn't just a diagnosis of osteoporosis out of the blue. It was because you had some, some gut health issues, right? 
Yeah, absolutely. Uh, for me, um, obviously there are multiple conditions and diseases that can affect the body's ability to, ability to absorb nutrients. Celiac disease is one of them. And it's one of the primary reasons I developed osteoporosis in my early thirties. And you know, how, you might be thinking like, how would celiac disease, this autoimmune condition, uh, condition contribute to nutrient malabsorption and bone loss? Well, when you ingest gluten, those villi, which, you know, I would consider our roots, like roots in our soil, they become blunted to the point where they, they can't do their job. And so for me, my roots effectively became damaged and my body was being starved of these key bone healthy nutrients like calcium, phosphorus, vitamin D. Those are usually absorbed you know, up a little higher in the small intestine where more damage is likely to occur. And this went on for years and I had no idea calcium was being raked from my bones to serve other purposes because you need to be taking, if you're not taking those nutrients in on a daily basis, your body still needs calcium and other minerals to execute its daily functions. Uh, so muscle contractions, nerve impulses, all these different things, your bones are a great reserve of those minerals and those nutrients. So it's got to pull from somewhere. So for me, you know, I wasn't absorbing, that was a major problem and it was contributing to uh, bone loss and osteoporosis. And the greatest challenge I see for a lot of people here is that a large percentage of people who have celiac disease don't even know it because they don't have the classic GI symptoms, which would be, you know, the bloating, the gas, the stomach pain, all those kinds of things. They don't necessarily have that. So you may not even be aware that your roots are being damaged, your villi are being damaged. And with one to 3% of the US population uh, and close to 5% of all people with osteoporosis having celiac disease or some kind of digestive issue, it's important to know if your roots are being damaged. So one of the ways that you can figure that out is if you've been consuming gluten for about 30 days, at least, you gotta have the antibodies built up. I know a lot of people are already doing gluten-free, so you might not have the antibodies present, but there's a test called the TTG IgA, uh, and that test can actually help uh, you understand if you've, uh, if you've got celiac disease. There's also another one called the total serum IgA that you would do there too. And then some, some different antibody tests that you can also do. So, you know, and, and I think a lot of people would think that, you know, osteoporosis or osteopenia is a condition of somebody that's in their later stages of life. And uh, that's not exactly true. Um, what is the prevalence, the demographic prevalence of osteoporosis, osteopenia? I know, you know it leans a little bit more towards female to male ratio, but you probably have a lot more current data than I have on that. So, yeah, well, so most of the people that we work with, they're women 50s to 70s. And uh, part of the reason for that is, is that most of the time when women hit a certain point in their life, post-menopause, sometimes it's even when they're hitting, when they hit 65, that's when their doctors say, you know what, let's go ahead and run uh, or do a bone density scan. Um, and usually at that point, you know, they, they're kind of reacting. They get their bone density scan. And let me even just walk through real quick. What, what is osteoporosis? That might be a good mm -hmm. understanding for people. So Osteoporosis literally means porous bone. It's a disease characterized by either not enough bone formation, excessive bone loss, or a combination of both. And in osteoporosis, both bone density and bone quality are reduced. And when that happens, it's going to increase the risk of fracture. So the way you find out you have osteoporosis is through a DEXA scan. Right. And that's dual energy, x-ray, absorption geometry. It's a painless test kind of like an x-ray, but very low levels of radiation. You lay down on the machine, the machine does a scan, which tells you your bone mineral density. And that's the actual mineral content of your bone. And then it generates a score. And the score is called a T-score. And the T-score is telling you how much your bone mass differs from the bone mass of an average 30-year-old adult, approximately. And a score of zero is going to mean that your bone density is equal to the norm of the healthy young adult. Plus one, minus one, still considered normal and healthy. T-score between negative one and negative 2.5 indicates you have low bone mass, or sometimes that's called osteopenia. And then a T-score of negative 2.5 or lower, so negative 2.6, negative 2.7, so on, that's considered osteoporosis. The greater that negative number becomes, 
the more severe the osteoporosis. Now, most women, notice I said women, are going to get these scans done by the time they're 50s and 60s as a check in the box. Kind of like I said, their doctors are going to order them, but that's usually too late. So I always like to, you know, if people have daughters and things like that too, they're in their 30s, their 40s, uh, or, or you're in your early 50s and 60s, and you haven't had a DEXA scan yet, I would go get one. Okay. Uh, that's super important. And it's not that men, you know, don't get osteoporosis, don't have osteoporosis, but a lot of times that's not being tested. Uh, and even if somebody has digestive issues and things like that, I, I always recommend if somebody has celiac disease, go get a bone density scan, you know, or your ulcerative colitis or Crohn's disease or something like that. Any digestive issues, go get a bone density. Uh, but usually men are not the ones getting those tests done. And in my experience, men may be a little more likely uh, to learn about the problem, maybe not see it as big of a deal. Uh, maybe just kind of, um, for for uh, lack of better words, suck it up, uh, you know. And but it's sure. not really one of those conditions that you can do that with. So um, usually, women fifty fifties to seventies are usually the ones. There, the, yeah. So um, you know, you had touched on it right at the start. There's there's the conventional method of trying to deal with it, and many times that method leads to more brittle bone um, rather than stronger bone. They may, you know, the the, the pharmaceutical uh, methods specifically. Can you speak to that a little bit? The, the actual pharmaceutical method, methods. Yeah, of, methods, yeah. Yeah. So a lot of times, what happens is when someone gets diagnosed with osteoporosis, they're sitting in the office, they had their bone density scan, they come out, the report says you have osteoporosis, and the immediate reaction there most of the time is if you're in a, a physician's office they're going to recommend a bone medication to up your calcium, to up your vitamin D. Now, that is not enough. There are more questions that we have to ask at that point in time to really make the best decision for your health. So here's what I, I want to kind of uh, tee this up with a metaphor or an analogy of a bucket. Okay, so imagine you have a bucket of water. The bucket represents your body. The water within the bucket represents your bone mineral density, the measure of how much bone you have. Then I tell people to visualize that this bucket has a small hole in it with a very tiny leak. And over time, over years and years, that water level gets lower and lower and lower until one day you realize your water is low. You go, you get that bone density scan, you realize you have low bone density and you're shocked. I thought my bucket was full of water. And usually it's one of two scenarios. Either you have a bunch of other health issues or digestive issues or things like that. And that's what led you to get a DEXA scan. Or you're on the opposite end of the spectrum. You work out, you eat healthy, you think you're doing everything right. You get that DEXA scan done. You have osteopenia or osteoporosis. In either of those two scenarios, you have this immediate visceral reaction. How do I fix this right now? And Usually we have some kind of impending sense of doom, desperate scramble, to secure our future. And, and we just want to reach some sort of re resolution. And sometimes when we're in that position with our physician in the doctor's office, you might be influenced to make that decision there to immediately plug the hole and fill your bucket back up with water. And we do this before identifying where the hole is, what caused it or if there was even a hole in the first place, because your bucket may not have been full of water to begin with. So, sure. Good and and I, I could even take that a little bit further in terms of the first question somebody has to ask is, are you actively losing bone? Do you still have water leaking out of your bucket right now? The single bone density scan is not going to tell you that. Right. There is one test called a serum CTX test. Okay? okay. And that looks at the activity level of cells that are breaking down bone. Basically, it's it's measuring collagen bone protein fragments in, in your blood. And if that activity level is really high, that can be an indicator of active bone loss, that you have a hole in your bucket right now that needs to be addressed. 
And what's creating that, you know, I guess what we're really talking about is that the uh, cellular level, um, I know you're familiar with it, maybe a lot of the listeners are familiar with it, little cells called osteoclasts, they're always tearing bone down, and little cells called osteoblasts are always building bone up. It's a constant repair and regener regenerative process that the human body goes through. It's an amazing, really an amazing system, quite frankly. Yeah. And, and so when we get that out of balance, that's where we have the demineralization or bone loss occurring at a at a at a leak in the bucket kind of reality like you're describing. And so uh, so you're kind of advocating um, some type of a uh, process that determines the actual actual loss of bone rather than just a, a certain snapshot of time. Exactly. Right. So when you look at the, the CTX. Uh, the serum CTX test, you're going to be able to tell if you're actively losing bone because that's that's a measure right now, but it's something that you can monitor in between your DEXA scan. So DEXA scans are done once every one or two years, right? Because the, the reason they're done that far apart is because the improvement that bone can make in a given time period is not as great as a lot of people think. Right. If you're making a three to five percent improvement in a one year period, which is within the margin of error of a bone density scan, that's a pretty solid improvement. Getting higher than that is really challenging and not really heard of. Like if there are greater changes in bone density in a one to two year period than that, um, it could indicate something is actually maybe positioning uh, and, and interpretation is off. Maybe there was an error. Maybe there was a fracture or some arthritis or something like that. But really it comes down to like, if, if we understand that we're actively losing bone or not, if we are, we then have to understand what is contributing to that bone loss. Uh, that's really the next part of this. So like, what are the things that actually contribute uh, to bone loss? So there's primary osteoporosis, which is typically related to a decrease in estrogen and postmenopausal women. Estrogen has a protective effect on bone. When estrogen levels decrease, as they do during menopause, it causes an increase in the activity level of osteoclasts, the okay. cells that break down bone, right? But then there's a whole nother cause of osteoporosis, and that's secondary osteoporosis. This is the category I fell into, uh, and this is where osteoporosis occurs because of the result of behaviors, conditions, diseases, disorders, and medications. Uh, most people who are unexpectedly diagnosed, uh, 30s, 40s, 50s, even in their 60s, have or had a secondary cause. And if that cause is still contributing to bone loss, you need to address it. And there can be multiple causes. And just because you're a postmenopausal woman does not mean that is the sole cause of your bone loss. It could be more than just hormones. Uh, and a lot of times in the doctor's office, you know, it's kind of chalked up to, oh, this is expected, um, or, you know, this is just hormones. And I, you know, I rarely see that a proper workup has been done, uh, which is really, really unfortunate because that's time, right? If you don't get the proper workup done at the beginning, and then you go a year, two years or three years, and maybe you had a contributor to bone loss that could have been addressed earlier on, we then have a lower starting point. And when you, it's much easier to slow and stop and prevent more bone loss than to build bone once we lose it. Both are possible. You can build bone strength at any age. It just becomes more challenging. The older you get and the more bone you lose, that there are fewer cells involved in the process and that process becomes less efficient. So it's just less super important to figure that out. Yeah, totally. And and medicines are one of the the impacts. I know prednisone can be a very challenging um, conundrum for people, you know, with bone loss. Um, so I know you, you're kind of touching on a little bit of that as well. How does how does uh, medication impact bone regrowth? Yeah, there are a lot of different medications uh, that can affect you know the progression of bone loss and osteoporosis. Um, so. You know, just even going through, you, you mentioned prednisone. That's absolutely one. Uh, glucocorticoids, you know, steroid medications, suppressing inflammation. They're mimicking the natural ster steroid hormones, you know, produced by your body. And they're often used to treat conditions like asthma, autoimmune disease, like rheumatoid arthritis. 
um, prednisone, cortisone, there are others too, but bone loss is a common side effect of using those. Uh, and part of the reason for that is because it's going to reduce the, the GI absorption of calcium. It's going to increase the urinary excretion of calcium, which is going to lead to that calcium deficit. And then glucocorticoids act directly on the osteoclasts to increase their lifespan and reduce bone density. Okay. And they further disrupt that bone remodeling process by decreasing bone formation. So pretty well studied and documented that that's going to happen. Immunosuppressive drugs, um, you know, they, they suppress, reduce the strength of the body's immune system. Uh, calcium urine inhibitors also contribute to bone loss. Uh, SSRIs, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. So th those are typically uh, used as antidepressants. And there was one review I, I know of, of, of 19 studies on the effect of SSRIs on bone that indicate they have a negative effect on bone mineral density and increase the risk of fracture. Um, some of the other ones, antacids. So if you're taking the omeprazole, Nexium, Prevacid, uh, and the H2 uh, receptor antagonist drugs like Zantac, those are not going to be good, right? And just, to, just for proton pump inhibitors, because a lot of people take those uh, because right. they... Right they feel like they have too much stomach acid. A lot of times when people have too much stomach acid, it's, they actually don't have enough stomach acid. Right. And uh, that's causing some splashing up in the esophagus and things like that. It's going to, you know, give them that, that desire to use uh, proton pump inhibitors. But with proton pump inhibitors, a lot of times people mistakenly think they have too much stomach acid. And it's when we suppress that, it's a problem because we need stomach acid to break down and extract nutrients from our food, right. amino acids, calcium, magnesium, iron, B12. Uh, your body needs stomach acid to get those nutrients. And long-term use of these could, is going to decrease intestinal absorption of calcium. It's going to increase the risk of osteoporosis and some other conditions too. So not the best thing to be using there for sure. Yeah, medicines are medis medications are very, 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 very challenging in so many different ways. And bone just rebuilds at such a slow pace. You know, it, it you know, blood cells live for about 100 days, bone cells live for seven to 10 years. So there's just a different game going on there. And it, it can have that slow drip in the wall kind of an effect. And you kind of get caught off guard. I, I thought it was interesting what you said that, you know, a lot of times we're not able to necessarily replace the bone, but we're able to stop the bone loss a little bit more effectively. I use that kind of, you know, analogy a bit in my office with uh, postures, for example, you know, if you've got somebody that's, you know, at a certain age and they're, they're starting that posture forward, um, you know, I say at the very minimum, we want to keep it from getting past that point. You know, mm -hmm. when you haven't really got into the, the exercises uh, and I kind of like to kind of go there or positions because you know, those have impacts on people with osteopenia and osteoporosis. But I guess where I was kind of going there for a second is uh, trying to help people understand that uh, we want to keep from losing the status we have at the very minimum. And that's a huge gain. So it, that said, what are some of the things that specifically for exercise, for nutrition, you know, those types of things that you incorporate, that you coach, you know, for, for your, your clients and patients? Yeah. And, and just to reinforce that point again, always better to be on the side of prevention than reaction. You know, we work with people that have anywhere from no fractures and are super active triathletes, you know, all these things to people that have five to 10 fractures. Right. And I can tell you, if you're at that point or you're getting to that point, you know, it, it's going to drastically change quality of life. So I always encourage people to do the things they can to be on the side of prevention and not reaction. Let's talk about some actual actionable things, you know, in terms of exercise. So exercise plays a super important role in bone health. And there are two different types of stimuli that are really going to be best for improving your bones. The first one is muscle pulling on bone. Right. Second is impact. The most effective interventions are going to use both, usually one or both in combination. And what's happening is you know, muscle is going to pull on bone to make them stronger. So when you're doing resistance training and things like that, that's going to pull uh, the muscle is going to pull on the bone to make it stronger. And you've got this mechanical signal 
sending a chemical signal that's inducing structural adaptation, right? It's in, inducing that bone to grow and become stronger. Then we have impact exercise. And those are things where you're actually, you're surprising the bones, your multi-directional impacts. You're, it's not just about, you know, long distance running with the exact same impact is not going to have the same effect as somebody who's doing like soccer, for example, who's got multi-directional impacts that are doing quick bouts and short sprints and things like that. That's going to have a better effect on, on bone and bone density longer term. Let's talk about specifically for resistance training too. Uh, you want to start with good form, lower weight, and then build from there. So with that in mind, right, the first thing you need to do is you need to know what you need to do. Like what are the exercises you need to be doing, but you got to have good form. And then we, we need to make sure the intensity level is there too. And when, when I say intensity, sometimes that scares people a little bit, especially if you're not really an active person. But when I, I'm talking about intensity, I'm talking about the actual repetition range that's shown to uh, be the most effective in improving muscle and bone strength. And that's about the five to 10 rep range. Uh, that's really what the, most of the studies show. Um, and a lot of times too, you know, obviously you want to do good form. You want to make sure you've got a good hip hinge. You're protecting your spine and things like that. doesn't need, mean you need to be like uh, super careful and, and lessen the activity level. It just means you need to have good body mechanics and you need to do things right. And if you do have some kind of pain like osteoarthritis or knee pain or things like that, some of those things that can affect your bi uh, body mechanics. Right. You want to work through those first before you start increasing the weight. Okay. So you want to figure out the right way to do some of those things before you start up in that weight. And then in terms of the things that are not going to support bone density long-term, uh, swimming, right. Doesn't mean you should completely eliminate swimming, right. Can be great to get in a pool and relax and things like that. We shouldn't be afraid of anything like that. But at the same time, if you're, uh, you know, swimming consistently and that's your exercise, every single day, that's not putting that weight. That's not weight bearing. Uh, we want to actually uh, let gravity do its thing also. Thing. We wanna, yeah. 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 So, say we're taking away the gravitational forces. Exactly. And then when you do that, you're not giving any stimulus to your bones. That's what happens with, you know, astronauts and things like that. Their right. bone density is going to be reduced because they don't have that effect of the weight bearing. Uh, right. And then long distance running, again, I was talking varied impact is what we need. Varied impact. When you're running, if you're chalking up, you know, a five or six mile run every single day or multiple times a week as your only form of exercise, not only are we just working our lower half, you're not having that varied impact. So in order to have, you know, especially for like wrist fractures are common too, as people get, as people get older. Um, if you're running every day, you're making zero impact, you know, on this upper half of your body too. Uh, so, and a lot of times changes in bone, uh, especially with exercise are site specific too. So it's not like if you're running, the impact that it would have on your bone density is universal across your body. Or if you're doing a deadlift, you know, or things like that, those bigger compound movements are probably going to have a better effect. So exercise, super, super important. Huge. You know, I know there's different parts of the bone that are more vulnerable. For instance, the neck of the femur is more vulnerable. You know, you were talking about the wrist. Um, I'd like to come back to a couple of the exercise ideas, but why is it that there's certain parts of the bone that are more vulnerable? And, and you know, a lot of times people are saying, oh, you know, Susie fell and, and broke her hip. And then a lot of times it's actually, no, her hip broke and then she fell, you know, though. So what's happening there? Yeah. So a lot of times, uh, number one, let's talk about, uh, we talked about bone density earlier, but the first thing we, uh, I, I want to talk about with that is when you get a bone density scan, you only have part of the picture, right? So you only get your bone density at that point. The other part of the picture is bone quality. Okay. So bone density is how much bone you have, the measure of how much bone you have. Bone quality 
is how that bone is organized and laid out and that structural integrity of the bone. Those two things combine to create bone strength. So DEXA scan only gives you part of the picture. The other part of the picture can be found out from something called a TBS, trabecular bone score. That's an add-on software that can be on the DEXA machine. And what that's going to do is help you understand your bone quality. Um, that's one tool. There's another tool called REMS. It's more prevalent in Europe, it's starting to grow presence here in the US. Uh, that's called radio frequency echographic multispectrometry technology. So REMS okay. for short. And what that does is it not only looks at, it uses ultrasound technology, it looks at your bone density, your bone quality, and gives you a five-year major osteoporotic fracture risk. Okay, so like a fragility score, basically. That's super important to understand. And it's probably one of the reasons why I see, in some cases, people that have bone density in the negative ones, what would usually be considered osteopenia, uh, have maybe have fractured multiple times, which puts them into osteoporosis. Or, and then I've, I've seen people that are in the negative threes, you know, uh, that have never fractured before. A lot of that has to do with bone quality. The other part of the question is um, there are different types of bone in different places in the body. Um, so there's cortical bone, right? And then there's trabecular bone. Okay. Mm -hmm. So like if you're thinking about the long shaft of your femur and things like that, that's predominantly cortical bone. It's really hard outer shell. Uh, and then on the inside is like this honeycomb like structure. Uh, and that, is like the trabecular bone. Like the trabecular bone is really metabolically active. There's a lot of trabecular bone in things like your vertebrae. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of times, if there are going to be changes and improvements in bone density, that's going to happen easier with the trabecular bone because it's more metabolically active. It has more flow of nutrients and blood and things like that coming through. Gotcha. So coming back to the exercise idea that, you know, when we consider, you know, that extra information, it's not just the bone density, but it's the bone quality and just how metabolically active it is. That's part of what I'm sure as a coach, you're considering when you're putting together some kind of a plan for your patient, uh, you know, as far as, like you said, your technique has got to be really good. You've got to consider your angular realities and things of that nature. So uh, coming back to that kind of thought line and, and you know, going into more of a resistance kind of approach to um, training, have you found things like the push-ups, the pull-ups, uh, those things to have good impact on, on bone rebuilding and repairing? And is it, is it sometimes better or worse for somebody depending on their bone quality makeup? You know, those kinds of, of questions. It depends on the intensity, right? The intensity is what matters for people. So you know, if somebody is not like somebody's really active, um, they might be able to handle a more intense workout. Um, if somebody is not, that may do it. But push-ups are probably not going to be, uh, you know, those those forward type movements. Those aren't necessarily going to be the best thing for people. You kind of have to progress up to these things. Deadlifts can be really great. Squats, those big compound movements, the presses. Yes, push-ups can be helpful, but um, you want to have good form when you're moving, if you have low bone density, overhead presses. Uh, but again, it, some of that comes down to what is the person's actual bone quality? Have they had fractures before? We don't want to have a large axial load overhead if we already have had some spinal fractures. Um, so there are a lot of, there are a lot of variables in there. Um, but it's going to go through, you're going to walk through posture. That's really important to start out with balance. Not It's not just about resistance and lifting weights. It's yeah. about kind of bringing in the whole picture to make sure that you're doing all those things long term. And how about vibration, rebounder, those kinds of things? What do you find? How, how is that impacting the bone's ability to rebuild and repair? Uh, so vibration, there is some uh, some research on some of the devices that there's that kind of a minimal benefit. It's not going to be a major, major benefit in terms of improving bone density, but I would consider those more of like that, more of like a complementary technology, like a vibration plate, but it's not a replacement, 
right? It can't just be, and I do hear people say this is, oh, you know, I bought this vibration plate. It was X number of dollars or whatever, but they didn't actually figure out the exercise part of it first. Sure. So sure. I usually say, get the exercise down first. And then if you want to explore other of these technologies and modalities and things like that, that's okay. Uh, possibly, but always start with the core exercise plan first. Rebounders, yeah. kind of the same thing also. Um, could potentially be helpful, um, but you want to, that wouldn't be the replacement for the full exercise plan and things like that too. Gotcha. Yeah. And so one of the things we haven't uh, touched on, I don't know if you do it in your office at all, or if it has any impact, um, you know, some of the natural therapies, uh, nutritional supplementation, um, I don't know if you do anything like ozone injections or ultraviolet blood irradiation or hyperbaric chamber type things. Are any of those things in the realm of bone health? So we we do not kind of expand into that, but it's not to say that some of those technology or some of that couldn't be helpful. Okay. Um, it's just not something like when we're putting together someone's core plan, mm -hmm. we usually try to crowd out because people can implement or try to implement a lot of things. So we usually sure. try to crowd out everything that's not within the core focus of somebody rebuilding their bone strength, getting their nutrients, figuring out root causes. Then once we get beyond that, that's when there's the potential to explore other things. So if somebody were starting out and, and we're just saying, okay, where do you start? Uh, let's, let's put the tactical that more of the tactical stuff aside. Let's start with like kind of the bigger picture strategy. So the first thing, kind of what we talked about earlier is you have to know if you're actively losing bone, Yes, you have to know the tests that you need to get there. So there's one, the CTX, but then what, what does a full workup look like for that? Then um, what is contributing to that bone loss? How do we address those things? How do you have those conversations with your doctor without fully burning that relationship? Because that's super important because usually they're going to want to take, want you to take a medication. Um, but that's not something that most people I work with want to even do. Um, sure. And the next part of it is nourishing the body, getting the raw materials and nutrients that you need for stronger, healthier bones through diet, through digestion, through absorption. We need to make sure you have the right inputs to produce stronger outputs because you can't possibly expect to rebuild something that's not there, right? And that that's happening on three levels. The first layer is, are you taking in the right nutrients in the right amounts? And I can talk about some foods, you know, specifically to help with that in just a sec, but are you taking in the right nutrients in the right amounts? Um, are you actually absorbing those nutrients? Remember what I was saying earlier is even if somebody doesn't have overt digestive issues, there could still be an issue with nutrient absorption. And the third one is, uh, are those nutrients making it to the cell level? A lot of times, even if someone's eating healthy, I eat whole 30, I eat paleo, I do these things, they still might not be hitting layer one. Uh, so that's super, super important. And the third part of that is, you know, you got to reduce your stress, improve your sleep, get the right exercise plan in place to so talk about, to go back to the nourish and talk about some specific foods and things like that. A lot of times people ask me, uh, what is the perfect diet for osteoporosis? And they hate my response because it's different for every single person, right? We are all biochemically and genetically unique individuals. We respond to different foods and supplements and dietary approaches differently. And that's why there's no dietary approach to be considered a rigid framework with zero flexibility. That's number one. Uh, the second one is when you hear a lot of people saying, everybody should eat this specific superfood because it's guaranteed to be good for your body and your bones, make note of it, but realize that might not actually work for you. Because no matter how much of a superfood or a health food someone says something is, if it creates inflammation in your body, it's not a health food for you. Uh, so let's just talk about what are some foods that generally speaking work well for most people. Um, the first one, if you like seafood and fish, uh, some of the canned, canned salmon 
mackerel, anchovy, sardines, herring, the ones with the bones. Uh, and, and they're not like, it's not like eating a salmon filet and you're eating the hard bones that'll get stuck in the side of your mouth. If they're in the can, they're actually, they almost kind of melt in your mouth. They're kind of really soft. And it, the great thing about canned salmon with bones in them or sardines, right. bones have all of the minerals and nutrients you need to support your own healthy bones. How great is that? Great source. Yeah. Exactly. So it's, and it's not just about calcium, it's about magnesium and, that, and, and quite a few other nutrients too. But then it's a great source of protein and omega threes. Mm-hmm. Omega threes are going to help dampen that inflammation. Inflammation contributes and fuels bone breakdown in the body. So salmon, mackerel, anchovies, uh, sardines, those are great. Vital Choice is a great brand for that. I don't have any affiliation with them or anything like that, but they're a great quality brand uh, that has great tests. So the next one I would say that works really well, coconut oil. Coconut oil, considered one of the healthiest foods on the planet with over 1,500 studies showing its benefits, not just good for your bones, good for your energy, your weight, brain function, heart health, memory, you know, all these different things, gut health. Um, And for bones specifically, There were a couple studies that looked at the use of virgin coconut oil on bone loss. Both helped show that virgin coconut oil is not just helpful in the protection against bone loss, but also in the improvement of bone structure. Part of that is due to compounds in coconut oil called polyphenols uh, that can help protect the body's cells and tissues from damage. Uh, But then talking about the digestive side too. So you've got this great healthy fat but then it also has antimicrobial and antifungal effects. Close to 50% of the fatty acids in coconut oil are lauric acid. When the body digests lauric acid, it forms a substance called monolaurin. And both lauric acid and monolaurin can help fight bad bugs, pathogens, and even the same bacteria that causes staph infections, C. diff, and, and the same candida yeast that causes oral thrush. So, You can also help your digestive health with this. And then coconut oil also contains this type of fatty acids called medium chain triglycerides. Right. Right. And and we'll call them MCTs. MCTs are metabolized differently than other fats. They go straight to the liver where they're converted instantly into energy and ketones. Ketones are an efficient, clean burning energy source for the body. So great fat, you know, that to test out incorporating into your plan. Let's talk about leafy greens for a sec. A lot of times people, um, when I'm talking to people, they're eating a lot of spinach and things like that. Um, That's not, arugula is actually my preferred green there. Okay, arugula is a leafy green. It's the same cruciferous family of vegetables as broccoli and kale. It's rich in potassium, folate, vitamin C, vitamin K, and calcium. 85 grams, about three ounces, provides up to about 200 milligrams of calcium. And arugula also contains high levels of phytonutrients, um, which are going to be great for your skin health and your eye health. But uh, spinach, like I had mentioned earlier, people, you know, if you're in the store and you're looking and you turn a container of spinach over and you see on there that it has high levels of calcium, what a lot of people don't understand is that calcium is not bioavailable. Okay. Uh, it's blocked up with something called oxalates. Yeah. The oxalates are an issue. Oxalates are considered an anti-nutrient that can bind up these bone healthy nutrients like calcium uh, in our intestinal tract and block their absorption. So some people with digestive issues, kidney stones, arthritis, joint pain, those may be indicators they may have a hard time breaking down and degrading that oxalate. Um, So in those cases, uh, we can swap that spinach for the arugula. Have you found if you uh, denature it a little bit, the spinach or the broccoli or the cauliflower, does that help with the oxalate? It does, it can reduce boiling, uh, is gonna have the greatest impact, but when you boil, especially your greens and things like that, you're gonna lose some nutrients too. Right, right. Uh, So arugula is a great one, and by the way, It's not to, it would be really hard to eliminate all oxalates. It's sure there are low oxalate diets and things like that, where it's possible to get really, really low levels, but 
to not obsess about this. I don't really want people obsessing over these kinds of things, but you can start to make swaps, right? You can start to slowly make swaps and eventually, you know, you're not even going to recognize that um, you've, you've made that swap. And it's, it's not to say you should never eat anything with an oxalate in it, uh, sure, but sure. like, that's just not going to happen. Right. Yeah. I understand it. And then I would also say one, one other one that I would add in there, actually two, two other ones, uh, blueberries, blueberries are great for a uh, bone building plan. Studies indicate that blueberries can help prevent bone loss, show favorable changes in bone biomarkers, have a protective effect on bone. Uh, they're loaded with bone healthy nutrients, vitamin C, vitamin K, manganese, fiber. They have one of the highest antioxidant levels of all fruits and vegetables, which is great. Uh, there's one group called anthocyanins. And that's what gives blueberries that beautiful color. They're thought to be responsible for a lot of those health benefits. So heart health, brain function, digestion, and they taste good. They're widely available. They're practical. It's not some rare Amazonian fruit, you know, for the select few. Right. They're, it's realistic. Uh, and it's a great addition to smoothies. And it's a replacement for sugary sweet treats. The kids, the grandkids, everybody, everybody likes those. Uh, vitamin C rich foods. Those are another group. And vitamin C is super, super important for bone health. Uh, and it's linked to a lot of pretty impressive health benefits. So um, beyond just bone health, high blood pressure, heart disease, gout, iron deficiency, memory, cognition, inflammation, the body needs vitamin C to form blood vessels, cartilage, muscle, and even collagen in bones, right? Remember bones are this made up this collagen protein matrix upon which minerals are laid. And what's happening is vitamin C is stimulating pro-collagen. It's enhancing collagen synthesis and it's stimulating alkaline phosphatase activity, which is a marker for osteoblast bone building cell formation. Pretty cool. Really? Uh, really cool. Yeah. And then, you know, so from a practical perspective, right? What some of the best fruits, berries, citrus fruits like lemons, uh, I wouldn't be doing a whole lot of bottled orange juice. That's a pretty concentrated source of sugar. Right. right. Um, kakadu plums, acerola cherries, uh, strawberries. Those are some great fruits. And then in terms of vegetables, vitamin C rich vegetables, red and yellow bell peppers, chili peppers. Uh, now, if somebody has an autoimmune condition, maybe maybe avoid the peppers, uh, at least starting out, especially for, from a nightshade perspective. Nightshade. Yep. Uh, but dino kale which is uh, not curly kale. There are a couple different types of kale, but dino kale or lacinato kale, some lightly steamed broccoli, red cabbage, fresh thyme, parsley. Those are great. Um, yeah. So those are some good ones. Vitamin C is a great, great addition to the nutrition awesome. plan. Awesome. That's really cool. Yeah. So we're kind of getting close to wrapping up here and there's just all kinds of information that I'd love to dig a little bit deeper on, but to, to summarize a little bit of what you're saying, you know, there, as far as, you know, the, uh, the idea goes is to find out where you're at, you know, get the testing done, try to find out where you're at. Um, you know, when you consider the exercise, really resistance training is going to be the best. Like you said, having the varied um, intensity and not just a, a repetitive long jog, but, you know, maybe some uh, co-activating kind of high intensity interval training kind of things that you can add in the, the fast stops and starts being careful to, to know your, your integrity of your bones so that you don't put too much torsion or compression on bones that can't handle it. But also and, and I'll add in there too, um, the walking, walking, which I actually don't think I mentioned then everybody and that's part of the recommendation, calcium, vitamin D walking bone drug walking is it's a great activity it's great for your health great for longevity great for your cardio cardiovascular system but it's considered an endurance exercise right mm -hmm. so it's it can be helpful for maintaining bone but it is not going to be building bone right mm -hmm. at least not a significant amount that you you may think that uh, it's going to have so walking right. alone is not enough right right have to add some had some start stops in there um, so, yeah, and then the nutrition, one of the things that you um, did not mention, and I'm sure that, uh, you know, we need to make sure people did not hear 
uh, you know, we didn't add any carbs into this conversation of nutrition, <laughs> you know, so yeah. carbs are inflammatory, they're going to be hard on the body, you know, everything we were talking about is, a, is really, you know, some of the natural organic approaches to eating, you know, when it comes to fruits, vegetables, proteins, that kind of stuff. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, that's a, an important part. So any, yeah. So if you could just uh, let us know how to follow up with you to maybe uh, become a, a client um, and, and maybe you're just top three takes that, you know, I tried to summarize a little bit myself here. You can always find me at bonecoach.com. Uh, and it's not just me. I have a, we have a team of at this point, uh, about 12 people. Uh, we have highly credentialed experts that are well-respected in their fields that are contributors that are, uh, you know, teaching and helping guide people and things like that. And we walk people through a step-by-step -step process. We also have a YouTube channel that's got some like recipe videos and some really helpful things like that that you can find at Bone Coach, uh, Facebook page, Instagram, all those. And we got a podcast too. So Bone Coach, if you look that up, you'll probably find those. And then in terms of some major takeaways from this conversation, again, number one, if you have not had a bone density scan yet, go get one. Uh, get your baseline now. Don't avoid doing something because you're, you don't want to know where you actually are. Don't avoid addressing something because you don't want to know if the news is bad, right? That's not a good strategy for long-term health. The next part of that is when you're asking for your bone density scan, ask if they have trabecular bone score technology. So that way, at the same time you get your bone density, you can get your bone quality. Right. That's going to be two key determinants of bone strength. Then once you get that, if you have osteopenia and osteoporosis and you're having that conversation with your doctor, don't just jump into, you know, I can't tell you don't take a medication, but I can say make an educated and informed decision. Okay, so you need to understand, are you actively losing bone? If in that conversation, the doctor recommends medication, you haven't had your CTX done uh, and uh, you need to get that, right? Ask for it. You have the right to ask for that. Um, just say, I want to make the most educated and informed decision for my health moving forward. Uh, then if it is high and elevated, you need to figure out what's contributing to that. If you've got issues with diet and digestion absorption, got to nail those things down, get the right exercise plan in place. If you've got high stress, that needs to change. Stress is going to contribute to bone loss, pretty well documented there. And then also uh, poor sleep. Uh, poor sleep, again, very well documented. It will reduce bone quality. Uh, so all those things have to be adjusted and improved. And you got to be doing exercise. You got to move. You got to do the right movements. Those are the biggest things. It's the biggest awesome. thing. So you get those things dialed in. That's your great foundational starting point. And only then should you be branching out and looking at complementary kinds of things and technologies and modalities and all that. Yeah, get a good foundation going, plan a, a journey. It's not a quick fix. It's definitely a lifelong journey, which you know ultimately can lead you to be healthier after five years, uh, you know, no matter what age. You know, that's the one thing I find with my patients that are in their 50s or 60s or 70s. When they take something on seriously, uh, you know, whatever age, they are tending to be healthier five years later, even though they're five years older. It's awesome. Absolutely. Absolutely. Perfect. And I would agree with you 100 percent. Do not look for a quick fix. They do not exist. Uh, they do not exist. I don't help people with quick fixes. I'll tell people that that's, that's the wrong thing to be looking for. Don't look for an osteoporosis reversal. That's really misleading. Be careful about, you know, certain guarantees and things like that. You know, it's, it's not a quick fix. It's a slow process. But if you stick with it, the way I kind of put it is uh, progress, never perfect, always possible. You oh, stick nice. with it. You do the leading indicator things that give you the best shot at improvement long term, you will be healthier and you'll give yourself the best shot of building stronger bones and having an active future with the people you care about most. Awesome. Hey, well, everybody, I hope you've been blessed by this. I know I have. I'm going to leave it there. And, and thank you, Kevin, for joining us. And I hope everybody is uh, going to check you out. So awesome. Again. Appreciate the time.